It is I, the ultimate warrior of RPGs, and today I'm going to be doing a video for those of you new to the hobby, to the industry, to those that just are coming by looking for some information for somebody's mom who wants to see what their teenage boy or girl is getting up to, is getting into on those Friday and Saturday nights that seem to stretch on and on and on ever longer, ever longer. We're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons. We're going to be talking about Pathfinder. We're going to be talking about the basics. This is not, this is as unspecific to edition as absolutely possible from your main man. Now today, I'm going to be going over what really is, is the theme and feel of the game and how you put together a character, how you get involved, so that you can show this to your mom, to your dad, to your cousin, maybe, if you understand, and you can bring them in and show them sort of what you're doing and put it as eloquently as the leader of the barbarian horde might want to do. Now, Dungeons and Dragons has been around since the 1970s, I think 1974, uh, and there's many, many, many permutations of the game, uh, up to including Pathfinder, which is uh, just a permutation of Dungeons and Dragons. It's not a, a specific, unique game unto itself. That's a question I get a lot of people asking me. It's just a uh, an OGL version of Dungeons and Dragons. Right here, I have this is a 3.5 player's handbook, but that is not important because we're not talking about specifics to editions. Now, in Dungeons and Dragons, you need at least two people to play. One person plays something called a dungeon master. That's right, the master of the dungeon. That person creates everything that the other players feel, hear, sense, experience in any sort of way, and everything that is not a player character. All the the, the bit roles and the large roles, the villains, the monsters, the recurring iron uh, monger or uh, sailor or tavern winch, whatever it is, the king of town, whatever they happen to be, the Dungeon Master controls and role plays. They stay in character and they describe as if you had an impromptu acting troupe. That's how the Game Master uh or Dungeon Master goes about their job in, in running a Dungeons and Dragons uh, game or a Pathfinder game. They're also in charge of combat. The monsters that attack the player characters, uh, mapping out elaborate dungeons, creating taverns, uh, creating cities and coasts and gods and demons and devils and angels and all manner of things. The weather, the climate, the topography, the feel of the underground world, uh, engaging all five senses in description. But, you know, perhaps we're getting just a bit ahead of ourselves. So that's what a dungeon master does. You only have one of those, regardless of how many players you have. The number of players can be as many as the dungeon master wants. Often more than the dungeon master wants. But you need one. It's not a game to be played solo. It's not uh, that at all. Though it is very vaguely similar to an old style of choose-your-own-adventure, Car Wars, Lone Wolf, uh, book and that interactive quality it is interactive of impromptu uh, uh, acting and that, that's really what you get with the game you assume as a player character a player that's everyone that's not a dungeon master you assume the role of a hero or sometimes a scoundrel in this world think about Red Sonia, Conan, Willow uh, uh, even something like Labyrinth has some elements into Dungeons and Dragons um, really any of those fantasy movies out there, fantasy novels, which you may be a little less familiar with, so I picked the fantasy movies, sort of give you an idea of what you're going to be doing in Dungeons & Dragons. You get together, typically a group's going to be one Dungeon Master and four to six players. The players assume the role of brave warriors. Brave warrior needs food. Uh, they assume the role of wizards, the role of, of gnomes, and unfortunately halflings. Uh, and uh, these these sorts of characters. And the game can have as light or as dark, as silly or as serious of a tone and mood as the, as the, as the group wants. That's uh, a wonderful thing about it. There's no one way to play. There, There's a, a plethora of different play, play styles. You can play very tactically. You can play very, very immersed. You can play very cinematically. You can play very realistically. And you can blend all these elements of the style to produce the sort of game that you want to play. But let's not worry about that. I'm trying to get into the meat and potatoes, and so you can sit down and explain to your mom in a nice short video, which will probably drag on, <laughs> as is my want to ramble. We're going to talk about what we have here. Now, if you are a player character, and that's really more what we're aiming here for, and I have a number of other instructional videos for those new to the hobby, how to, how to uh, play Dungeons & Dragons, how to uh, 
be a game master, how to play Vampire the Masquerade, videos like that that will really help give you some more details. And I just talk in a very basic sort of way, explaining this to people that, that are new to the hobby, that don't understand, that want to understand. And I want you to understand, and I want you to join our hobby and be part of our hobby and have a great time because it's the best hobby there is. It, it stretches your imagination, your mind. You will learn a tremendous amount of different things. So th this is a wonderful hobby. Now, Right here, what I'm trying to show you, this is a 3.5 version of a Dungeons and Dragons character sheet. Character sheets in all versions of Dungeons and Dragons, you are free to copy. Uh, to there is no copyright really on these in terms of uh, you can duplicate them. That's what I'm trying to say. You can drop it on your computer and your photocopy or whatever you have, and just just crank out a, a copy of this right on your printer, and then you can fill it out. You don't fill out the one in the back of the book. Uh, that's not a good idea. But on Dungeons and Dragons character sheets, all the editions of Dungeons and Dragons, and some of them uh, orient the stats a little bit differently, but they all, including Pathfinder, including D&D Next, 4th, 3rd, 2nd, AD&D, OD&D, whatever it is, they have the same stat line right here. Maybe the very first, there's some difference, but we're just going to go with what I'm saying. Because after all, we're not going to get into technical points. We're, we're trying to give a good layover for people that are interested in getting the hobby. You have Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. These are the six attributes, statistics, stats that your character has. Now, strength is a measure of how physically strong you are. How much can you bench press, pick up over your head, ultimate warrior style, and drop? How much can you carry? This is strength. How much uh, dexterity measures your, your agility, your hand-eye coordination, your ability to jump back and react quickly to a situation in front of you. Constitution uh, measures your resistance against poison and disease. How, how shredded and ripped you are. Do you have a situation or do you have a keg going on downstairs? What's going on with your constitution? Are you ill and sickly like a rastalin or are you a paragon of physical health? Now... Intelligence is just simply uh, your IQ. Now, there's going to be a little debate about that, but we're going to be simple here and explain that. You know, it's just in measure of how smart your character is. Wisdom is your character's common sense, a different thing from your intelligence. In real life, I'm sure you've met people who are dumb as a box of rocks, but they had a lot of common sense. And conversely, you might go completely the other way. You know, the, the idea of the absent-minded professor, the guy with a very high intelligence and a little wisdom. He's forgetful. He's dismissive. He doesn't engage the world uh, necessarily properly. Uh, and speaking of engaging the world, next we have charisma. Charisma is the um, personal magnitude your character has, the magnetic aspect of their personality, what gets them uh, to command the attention of others. It does not mean you're nice. Uh, it means that you can hold court. You can walk in a room and have everyone pay attention to you if it's high, or if it's low, everyone walk in the room and go, oh, this guy. It's your cool factor. It's how much people are going to like you, whether they agree with you or not. And when they don't agree with you, the words you say still may hold a great deal of sway and be very interesting to them because you have charisma. Most versions of Dungeons and Dragons have something equivalent of a saving throw. Saving throw! Uh, saving throw is something you may have heard. It has references many, many, many times in pop culture. The saving throw throws a lightning bolt at you, a, a trap comes to life Indiana Jones style before you, you're exposed to poison or disease or something like that, you roll your 20-sided dice and if you get a certain number, uh, generally a certain number or better, you're going to pass. You're going to have resisted whatever it is. You're going to have, have uh, got into your mind and shake off the effects of the vampire that tries to dominate uh, your, your mind and attempt to force you to do what it wants instead of what you want. You'll say, no, no, not today, not this time, not ever. Now, there are uh, an attack. Attacks are something you're always going to be making in Dungeons and Dragons. Remember, you're playing the role of wizards and warriors, of barbarians and cavaliers, of uh, rogues and thieves and virtuous paladins, scornful anti-paladins, witches, warlocks, assassins. Uh, all these options and more. Even the bard are available in Dungeons and Dragons. And these are only base beginning stereotypes aspects to begin your play with, if you can imagine it, if it will fit in the context of a world of fantasy, you probably are going to be able to play it. And that's one of the great things. It is an exercise in your own creativity and your own creativity to entertain yourself and the others by extension of the way that you play. Now, 
I say that to say, you know, you're playing a warrior, you might have a, a, a sword, whether it's a, it's a short sword or a log sword or a bastard sword or, a, or an enormous claymore. You may have a battle axe or a mace or a flail or a, a scourge, a whip. You might have a, a, any sort of polearm, like a bill or a glaive or uh, a halberd, a bardic, an pike. You might have, you might be a slinger or a bowman or a crossbowman. You may wear simple uh, a simple hide shirt made of animal skins or a fine leather jerkin. You might wear a plate mail or scale mail or split mail or ring mail or barded uh, uh, armor uh, and, and you may even have barded armor for your, for your horses. Do you understand? You're going to really have a lot of options there on how you can dress yourself up in terms of the clothing that you're wearing, in terms of the armor that you're wearing, in terms of the weapons that you're using. And these weapons, they have different applications in most D&D games, not in all there's a different damage factor. And even even in the earliest ones, there was by a, de by a degree, I'm not going to go into explaining specifics, a different damage factor. Now, that means you're going to have a different statistical in play if you have a mace versus uh, having a, a scimitar. These weapons are going to function differently. So your character uh, can select that, and that means you know, you're going to be walking around in the game. Think of a description of your character, and your description changes because now you have a scimitar, now you have a warhammer, now you have uh, an awe pike, and choosing a weapon. Weapon is so iconic for your character as you progress and advance on. Now they may, you may change weapons. You may hey, have a vulge uh, this week, and uh, next week I end up having a flail. You may be a bowman, but you also uh, use a long sword or a short sword or a rapier at times as another weapon. You may uh, be a, someone who has dozens of daggers or throwing axes, and you use these weapons or javelins to uh, really bring across uh, a range fighting style. That's a great thing. You, you have options. You know, you can move away, you can move close, you can be on a horse, you cannot be on a horse, or you might even be able to ride a dragon, depending on the, the level of, of high fantasy versus, versus that, that gritty uh, style. So again, these things are options, they're possibilities. So you kind of want to start out, you select a weapon, you select a character type, you know, you want to play a, a fighter, a fighting man, a warrior, whatever you want to call them. You pick a race. In fact, honestly, you probably picked a race first. The typical races in your D&D game, here's your core races. A human, an elf, a dwarf. And the elves and dwarves are very Tolkien-esque, as is the halfling, which is originally called a hobbit, which is the hobbit from uh, Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Rings movies. Even if you see those Lord of the Rings movies now, they look a little different in the original drawings of a fat, stumpy little uh, hobbit. He's a more uh, spry, athletic sort there uh, in those movies, the Bilbo and, and the Frodo Baggins. And that's sort of the idea also that the, the hobbits have moved that way in Dungeons and Dragons games, or they call them halflings. They are hobbits, straight up and down the line. They're called halflings because uh, they got sued. <laughs> that's, that's why they're, they're not called hobbits. But they're Tolkien-esque inspired. Uh, which is the biggest, the single biggest influence on Dungeons and Dragons, regardless of some people try to try to come up with nonsense. But a uh, uh, wizard, uh, the Lord of the Rings, but it's not the only one. It's not just Lord of the Rings. There's a tremendous number of influences. I'm not going to go into that in this video, but a tremendous number of influences on Dungeons and Dragons. But if you watch uh, one of those movies, you read one of those books, you're going to have a good understanding of the kinds of fantasy worlds that can be created. Multitudes of completely different kinds of fantasy worlds can and should be created to keep it spicy, keep it interesting. Now, in Dungeons and Dragons, most editions have skills to one degree or another. You may be something as simple as a secondary skill. You have a background. I come from a fishing village. I know how to fish. So that would mean you know you could probably uh, tie ropes, mend nets. You could probably use a net. You know how to you know about different kinds of fish. You might or might not be able to swim, depending. Um, you know this fish is no good to eat. This fish is good to eat. Oh, that's a, that's shrimp. Uh, probably a few days too long. One of those shrimp. Let's let's throw them back. Uh, so forth, you know, or, or skills were derived just really from your background. I think my character should be able to do this because of X. Game Master, okay, let's roll with that. So that being said, we really need to um, think when, when, when we look at the, these different types of skills, what is the background? What is the, the idea of the character and make skills that are appropriate for that? Some additions have sliding scales, for skills, some it's just you have the skill or you don't, 
and some it's more uh, derived from your background to, to what you have. But all editions, in one way or another, have skills. Uh, it was not something that was a forefront of the game design, something that was clearly extraordinarily important. Can I climb this wall? No, yes, maybe, how well? Those are important things to decide for your character. And that's something to, to take into account. Your character is going to have skills, just like you have skills in real life. You might be able to drive a car, or you might know how to write your name or read a book. Those are all skills, and your character may or may not have those same sorts of skills or the equivalent of them in their particular fantasy world. So that's something to think about. Uh, now, in Dungeons & Dragons, you also have something called initiative. It's just for combat and order of how you go first. There are a number of monsters in Dungeons & Dragons, and you often get in fights with them. That's a big part of the game. So when you're fighting a gnoll or a troll or an orc or a gnome, you can have them, uh, the game master, roll initiative, and they'll tell you they go on X, Y, or Z number. Initiative is handled differently in different editions of the game, but <clears throat> it's basically just an order of combat who goes first and when. The game is not meant to play computer style. You go, then I go, then you go, then I go. That's not how it, it's all kind of happening at the same time, but we need to have an order of when actually blows or landing. The character's still moving, still doing things. He's not frozen in time or space. Mistakes some people do make at times, but it needs to have some some semblance of uh, when when different people are going to act, when they're going to make their descriptions, when they're going to make their choices and decisions of what they want to do. Dungeons & Dragons is a game that has magical items in it, powerful swords like Excalibur or great potions that can be drunk, and wisdom or strength or power can be gained from them and the knowledge of them. These uh, ideas uh, definitely uh, should come to most of your games, you're going to have wonderful and mystical items, whether they're cloaks or orbs or uh, they're spell books with magical intent and uh, items that speak to you. These can all be very, very interesting aspects to add spice to a game. It's always a good idea not to overpopulate magic items. After all, they become very uh, unspecial once they no longer all special. Your character should have a name. Your character's name should probably not be Bill the Carpenter, <clears throat> because in a fantasy game, they're generally dressed up to not particularly apply to uh, English, though we would be speaking English if we are English speakers, if you are uh, in Brazil. I don't know, I got Brazilian fans out there uh, watching the videos. If you're in Brazil, yeah, it's going to be Portuguese, but that doesn't mean uh, a name is still a name and you can kind of translate over. You know, your character's name may be a, uh, you're a human. You know, and particularly if you're an elf or a dwarf or a hobbit, your name might be something, uh, be a bit more appropriate to the culture. Many Resources exist both online and in many of the Dungeons and Dragons books to, to give you those names. In addition to the four races I, I added, even in the base books, they, they vary from edition to edition, but there's a number of other races that you can play. And outside of the base books, really, as long as your game master wants it, you could play a lot of things. I'm not going to say anything because that wouldn't be true. You can't really play a gelatinous cube, but you can play a large number of different types of characters. So, you have armor class and hit points. Those are another two things we're going to talk about before we get out of here. An armor class is going to be derived from your armor and from your dexterity. It's a mechanic that's a little clunky, uh, to be sure, but it basically affects how easy or difficult is it to hurt you. There's a lot of random chance in Dungeons & Dragons. You roll dice, the dice can, can help you go up, or they can help you go down. You could just really hit that guy well, or you could miss over and over again. You could deal lots of damage or, or no damage at all. You could succeed on your skill attempts, or you could fail miserably on them. So you have a, a degree of randomality in the game, which is something that brings people back. And that's why Aspect is, of course, it is a game. But it's not like a board game. You're not trying to win. Winning is coming back next week, is having fun, is enjoying each other's company, is, is keeping a story rolling and moving to whatever tenor that your group decides they want to have it, however serious or however light. That's what winning is. Winning is, is achieving fun, is having a game where people go, wow, that was a good time. I'd like to do that again. That's what's fun. Your character may die. But when they do, generally you can make another one, so it's not a big deal. If your character dies, you can make another one. Okay, you were playing a, a human blacksmith warrior. Well, your character died. Wow, look, it's a great time to play a dwarven wizard now who likes to uh, go fishing. And, uh, see, right right there. Now that's very, 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 very uh, narrow in terms of the kind of detail you'd like to put together. But it is, and again, really all you need. I'm a dwarven wizard who likes to fish, and we can start extrapolating from that and bring more background, bring more ideas, bring more character aspect to that dwarf. So your characters have a name. Uh, you have something called alignment, which varies a little in some of the editions, but 
It's basically, are you good? Are you virtuous? Are you heroic? Are you evil? Are you villainous? Are you sadistic? Are you orderly? Are you chaotic? Are you selfish? These sort of things uh, go into determining your alignment. And it's just a way to help you role play, but it also can have some uh, rather different uh, in-game effects. You, you have your class, and your basic classes are, are going to be your warrior, are going to be your, your rogue, are going to be uh, a wizard. Are they're, they're going to be a uh, cleric, a man of one of the gods of this world. Dungeons and Dragons usually employs, not always, as there are many variant worlds, and they can use any model, but it usually employs a polytheistic religious model based off of say ancient, uh, the ancient Greco-Roman religion or the ancient Norse or Egyptian or Babylonian, Sumerian uh, of the, the myths of Ireland or of, of Russia. Uh, you can bring, you know, of, of India, you, of uh, the, the Americas. You can bring any of those sort of ideas, those sort of seeds for divinities. There are tons of books that have different kinds of gods, gods that are made up and gods that are based off real world gods like Odin or Poseidon. You can bring those into your game. You can worship them. You can uh, attend to them in a pious fashion. Or you can rail against them with fury, uh, as we have seen the heroes in classic mythology. And that is, again, largely what you're playing. Someone from classical mythology. Someone from a, a book of Tolkien's, uh, Conan the Barbarian. Use all those archetypes to begin to feed, feed yourself a baseline to work with here. Your character has an, an age. They age in the game. Your, your character uh, has all the details of height and weight and eye color and hair color, physical description, you know, facial features. You, know, you can talk with a lift 50 wheel, baby. Or, or you can growl and snarl, Human, you are not past this bridge. You, know, you, you can do uh, all these different sort of things. You can engage uh, with hostility towards uh, anyone around you. Or you can engage peacefully towards them. You can attempt to, to barter peace with the gnolls or goblins, or you can you can punch a blacksmith right in the mouth. You are in charge of your character. You can do whatever you want. You can buy what you like if you have the money. You can uh, attack people. You can uh, build diplomatic relationships, have romances, fall in love, have children by land. You can uh, work for the duke. You can uh, go off and live in a cave by yourself. In, in the wood, you can explore the underground or uh, the, the mysterious glades, the far off islands in the mist. All these things are possible and far, far, far more. In fact, it would be impossible for me to sit down and do a video of the possibilities. They are uh, so large, limited, of course, as all things are, but as close to limitless as, uh, as imagination allows. That is really the option for what you can do. The character sheet, again, this is a 3.5 version. It gives you really everything you need to fill in. The game itself is, while not the easiest of games mechanically, it's not by far the most difficult either. It is the most iconic of role-playing games. There are many other role-playing games out there as well, but with Dungeons & Dragons, you have a... At the core of it, the game is a heroic quest. Men with steel armor and large weapons and... Uh, those with, with occult powers of magic pitting their might and bravery against uh, dungeons, against uh, forbidden woods, against overrun castles and keeps, against uh, nomadic borderlands or monsters roam. You're testing the metal and skill that you have against these sorts of things. And after all, there's always treasure. There is so much treasure, magical and mundane, gold and diamond, and your characters are likely to become laden with much of it over the course of their adventures. Uh, so that is what the basics of Dungeons and Dragons are. If you have someone in your family who doesn't really understand what you're doing, show them this video. It'll be a nice, easy walkthrough, and you don't really have to explain anything else as, as this is going to uh, bring the video together. Dungeons and Dragons game, you can use a sort of board game-ish with... Uh, miniatures and battle grids, or you can use a completely theater of the mind with just talking and immersing and speaking and explaining locations and positions and <clears throat> NPC development. These are all viable and different options and ways that you can engage the property of Dungeons and Dragons or of Pathfinder, which again are essentially the same game. So if you have questions about Dungeons and Dragons, just leave a comment down below. Your main man checks the pages, answers the comments, and I always invite all the members of the Barbarian Horde to do the same. 
engage, speak with each other, leave comments uh, to other viewers, and, and, and engage and keep it going forward like that. It's a good, safe zone for you, even if you don't have any concept of what you're doing. Leave, uh, leave questions. You will get answers. You will, you will get the knowledge. You will get there. Role-playing games are an extremely easy hobby. All you have to do is make a character and find a game and then play.